everybody, welcome back to Anderson's TV. I've got a very special guest today. Mr. James Johnson has come down uh, to talk about life, the universe, and everything. How are you? I'm very well. Good. Uh, and it's, nice it's to be, a pleasure. Nice to be here. I, I have to say, I'm, I shall slightly fanboy out. I think Biffy Clyro is one of the best bands this country has produced in the last 20 years. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm gone. Um, I'm gone. <laughs> let's go. I really do. <laughs> I, I, let's uh, leave it here. Let's, yeah, let's end it here. That's a, very kind of you. Great thank band. You. Uh, very kind of you. Really interesting songs, you know, amazing that it's a trio. This is a great band. Thank so you. I'm sh Biffy Clyro fans out I'll there will be it. going. I'll take yes, it. I'll take it. I, I agree. And if, if you're not familiar, go check them out. But yes, you play bass in that band. I do. Um, so let's talk about. I'm interested as someone else who also uh, tried to be in a band with my brother when we were growing <laughs> up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it was pretty tense. It, it can be difficult. So, so were you playing in bands with your brother before you formed Biffy? And No, no. So the, the story sort of goes, I suppose, um, it's got to start with our parents. Mm -hmm. Really, their love of music. Dad was a bit of a muso, you could see. He was always playing in bands. And, um, you know, they grew up, they were born in the 50s. So when they were like 13, 14, the Beatles came out and just changed right. everything for them. And yeah. their love of music was born at that point. And there was a kind of obvious passing on of that love to us. So music was always around the house. There was always guitars on the walls. There was always parties. There was always a lot of singing and going on. And it was just a part of our life. There was never really a conscious choice to get into music or anything like that. Um, but the boys studied music at school. I chose history. Right. Don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was thinking. And and they were in a band with another guy who they all had a massive falling out. He got right. kicked out. They asked him I wanted to join. It was all quite uh, natural and there was no big grand plan at that point. Uh, really. I hadn't realised. So actually you were the third to join. I was, was the it? third to join, absolutely. I didn't, I assumed it would have just no, been... No, so they, they were already in the band. I was playing guitar in the bedroom a little yeah. bit, you know, yeah. just having fun, but I just didn't really... I would film them practice and things like that, so I felt like I was involved. And there, there wasn't any great amount of thought. It was like, would you like to come and join? We booked some time in a studio, sure. I learned the songs and away we went. We never really, just never really looked back since then. Oh, that's cool. Were you, were you like the, um, I can't remember the bloody guy's name now, but the, the bass player in Spandau Ballet that basically didn't actually play Pretty bass much, yeah, until yeah. they said, we need a bass player. And he went, I'll learn it I'll then, learn it. It, it was more or less that. <laughs> I mean, I'd never picked up a bass before that point. Right. I'd strummed on the guitar, you know, my dad had taught me some things, but I'd never really, I don't know, it, it just it just all kind of fell in yeah. really nice. It, you know, look back now, it's kind of funny the way it started, but we, we didn't look back from that moment on, we were just, just going for it and um, deeply unpopular. Nobody else cared, but for some reason we did. And how have you, I mean, you're... Uh, your, your brother is your twin brother. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, you know... Do you, I have to say, actually, we've been lucky. We've been yeah. lucky. Seeing a lot of, never mind just in music, but brothers, sisters who work together, or it, it can be difficult. Yeah. It can be difficult. But I think the benefits definitely outweigh any of the kind of perils. Yeah. I think we are close. We are very yeah. close. And I, I think it's important to add that it's like three brothers in the band. Right. You know, we went to school with Simon since we were seven, eight years old. Right. We're all best, best of friends. And it couldn't really work if you just had two brothers yeah. and, and the other guy over there, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I think um, three brothers who've always supported each other well. There have been some tough times. Yeah. As everyone's life, everyone's life can be tough at times. So I think being there and having that genuine love for each other is, is what's allowed us to keep going. Does, does it enable, is it, is it a sort of a democratic band that you, It's you mostly know? democratic. That actually, <laughs> um, Tom York from Radiohead, they asked him more or less the same question. He said, well, it's like, it's like the United Nations, but I'm America. <laughs> 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 I thought that was a great line. That probably, that probably sums up a lot of bands, you know. I'm interested in... I, I should say, I think it's important to have a leader. Yeah. We were talk talking with my friends last night about different bands where there's eight guys in the band and there's no obvious leader. Yeah. I think you kind of need that in, in mm. any sort of enterprise, mm. you know? And, and is that by default Simon? Well, or he's, he's the songwriter, the yes, singer, you yeah. know, the face of the band. So it so sort of bends up. Absolutely. You have to sort of defer but, uh, to that uh, sometimes. To see a dictatorship would be unfair, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, a democracy would, all, would also perhaps not quite explain the whole thing. So. Yeah. Um, whoever we, however we figure things mm. out, we, we've managed to do it. 
I suppose if the, it massively helps that you guys have come together as friends first and Bandmates second. I think just growing up in the same part mm. of the world, having the same sensibilities, going to school together, knowing each other, yeah. knowing each other's families. Yeah. I think all of that, it really adds to your shared understanding of what you're going through. and mm. It allows me perhaps more sympathy with what Simon's going through as, a, as the singer and the front man, the pressure that yeah. comes with that. Um, I'm more likely to be sympathetic as opposed to it's just the singer, you know, it's, it's my boy, it's my boy. So. Oh, that's good. I'm interested, um, I'm always interested at, when I meet bass players. Mm -hmm. uh, I notice uh, you've it, not had a lot of bass players on your channel, you know, I'm just saying, no, I'm just saying. I, I, I totally agree, <laughs> I mean, uh, but, and, and, and I have to, you know, I'm, I'm not a, um, I, actually I, I went the other way, so I played bass oh, at you start like to be bass? 13, maybe 12 or 13, ah, a little okay. Heim, that, Heimberger, Steinberger, Headless, wow. like the cricket bat wow. thing. Wow, I bet you wish she still special. had that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, it, well, it was just hone a copy of it, you know. And I, I and I it, honestly, and I, I feel like I'm doing a huge discredit to bass players here. Mm -hmm. I picked it because I just thought it looked simpler than the yeah, one with well, six strings. Yeah, two less strings. <laughs> <laughs> and then bizarrely, I, I think. I, I, I don't know, I, just, I probably should have tried to get into a band as a bass player quicker, but I was like a year in, I hadn't joined a band and I was just getting a bit bored. And then I sort of tried a six string and realized that it actually, and I'm sure it looks more complicated, mm -hmm. but I think because on a six string, you're naturally playing melody there, there's something rather than- It's easier to get a tune out of yeah. a guitar. If you're just yeah. sitting on your own, that's perhaps why you haven't had many bass players on here, but yeah. if you're just sitting on your own at home, I think it's easier to get a nicer sound out of a guitar. Yeah. So, I think one of the hard things about playing bass is getting a good sound. Yeah, it's a tough, unwieldy thing. If you get small hands like me, it can be tough. But then you you came from a guitar first. Yes. So I'm interested. How has that shaped your contribution to the sort of the you know biffy stuff? Because it it's they're not. You know, I don't know how you personally like to hear Biffy described, but uh -huh. it's you know it's on the it's on the proggier side of rock than mm -hmm. the sort of it's not like a straight up ACDC style no. rock. It's it's. Do you think you're? Do you think that's because you're not interested in just playing straight? I think I do play quite straight. Right. Okay. And quite simple, <laughs> as as it goes. I mean, I, I don't know. It's the you're finding it hard to describe the band. I find it hard to describe the band, and I don't really have any great desire to describe nope. the band. I listen to it. Yeah, exactly. You can describe yeah. it yourself, but. Um, I suppose I play with a pick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned slowly to play with my fingers when when it's appropriate. I'm not very quick. Yeah. Um, that's probably had something to do with the sound. I think not having some of the sensibilities that a bass player have, learning to mute and getting really musical and technical with it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably kept things a bit simpler in a way. But um, I think a big part of our sound is just being a three piece and, and the limitations that come with that I think can be good. I, mean, I mentioned about having bands with seven or eight people. When you don't have any limitations, it, it can be quite difficult to know what avenue to take, how to get your sound, and you just have seven people all playing at the same time. So, um, yeah, I think maybe not having a formal education, mm -hmm. it's got to have some impact in the way you go about things. You may be a bit more naive, mm -hmm. you're a bit more simplistic approach, a bit more just kind of eyes and ears open, and, and you don't go into things going, right, I know how this should be. There's a little bit more of experimenting and figuring things out as you go. Did, did you have a, did you have a like, hero bass players that when you were young that you were trying to emulate or wanted to there, be there, like? there were guys that I loved their tone and I loved their playing but I never got to like be a fanboy of bass mm -hmm. players I was never that sort of geeky where it was like oh and I need to know everything this guy's doing every piece yeah. of kit I need to learn every line I really loved Jeff Hammond from ba from Pearl Jam right he, he was just I think just a really plays for the songs mm -hmm. really beautifully um, bass player from Ben Folds 5 is another yeah. bass player that I think has just got the best tone. Three piece with piano and fuzz bass. Yeah. I think that was quite, quite a big influence on me trying to get a sound actually. And, um, because Simon and I in the early records would play off each other, I, I need my bass to sound a bit more like a guitar mm -hmm. at times. And then when we're all playing together, the bass needs to sit below the guitar. And so using pedals and things, trying to kind of alter the sound, but always trying to play for the song, always just trying to play for the song, you know. It feels, I, I said to you before, you know, it would probably be slightly disingenuous of me to say that, you know, I know the Biffy back catalogue inside out, mm -hmm. but of the, the 
there's a, there's a couple of albums that I'm pretty familiar with, and what I like on those is the songs have a huge dynamic. You know, they go from very stripped back, mm -hmm. you know, to big soundscapes that almost belies the fact that you're just a trio. Yeah. What's your, you know, how does that sort of come around? Um, I, I've heard Simon described himself as a, a maximalist, <laughs> not a minimalist. So there's always more. There's always more. He seems to have melodies just falling out of him all the time. Lucky um, man. It, it's, it's lucky and it, it's amazing to, it, it's mm. almost like you're like, you bloody, how does he do it, you know? But it's amazing to be a part of and amazing to witness. Um, so there is a tendency to keep throwing things at it. If you keep hearing the melodies, mm -hmm. you, you've got to put them down. And it can be difficult to strip things back at time. At times, I think the dynamic, the, the big dynamic we, we we have, it's a lot to do with the, being big fans of Nirvana when we were kids. Oh yeah, okay. Bands like Mogwai, you know, yeah. Mogwai, no vocals, no no one's screaming at you, but it was one of the heaviest shows I've ever seen, because they've gone from whis whisper quiet yeah. to the yeah. loudest thing you've ever heard. Suddenly a big muff comes on and takes your head off, and I, I think that's always been. A bit of a, a trick we were trying to pull, I suppose, in mm -hmm. the early days. It was like playing in student unions and see how many glasses would shatter when you would kick in, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I think just been trying to really get the most out of just being three people. Mm. So we're all pulling at the same time or pushing at the same time. Is that your, how would you describe your role in the band? Is it is it to allow Simon to come up with the some idea and then just embellish that or what, what's the... I think so. I, 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 for me, I see my role as just, yeah, quite obviously between Ben and Simon. So trying to marry up with the kick drum, mm -hmm. but trying to marry up with the, the music as well and the, the melodies that Simon are creating. Because Simon played violin as a kid, right? It, it, his pinky's really strong. It's all six string chords all the time. It's a nightmare to tune his guitar in the studio. But quite... Um, very technical playing. Ben's a busy drummer. Mm -hmm. I feel there's got to be something that that presents it in a simple manner that it makes it a little bit easier to make sense of the chaos. Right. If that does that make sense? No, I, th <laughs> I think it's it's quite interesting that you're obviously you've obviously thought about this a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like what's the what is your Role and I like that. So it, there's a sort of there's a glue. I, I think my role is a supportive role. You, mm. you don't want you don't want, you can't have three front men. Mm. You can't have, a, you don't have a lead bass in this guitar, in this band. So I, I think, I, I think bass should be a supportive mm. role or that's kind of generally, it's a background instrument a little bit. But for me, I see as ma marrying up with a kick drum, that's really mm -hmm. important for power. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to create something that's a, let's say a, 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 a simple mm. backdrop so that you can then pre create some crazy mm. colors on top. If that sort of so makes you, sense. You, I mean, you talked about some of the bands that you that influenced you in bass players that did all from through the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, if you took a band like the Chili Peppers or whatever, where mm -hmm. Fleas kind of roll in that, it's quite much. It's more, more prominent. Prominent. Absolutely. Is, was that you were never? Was that never a desire that you had to sort of you know have some biffy songs where the bass line was a bit more of the driving melody in the in the um, song? I, mean, I think there are points where that happens. I don't know if being shy is something to do with okay. it. Okay, <laughs> not as outgoing as Flea, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and and I don't have that same style, which which yeah. lends itself to to being more of a kind of lead part or whatever. But I mean, there's lots of stuff where uh, the bass is sort of leading leading at parts. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly through verses and things like that. But um, I'm not that much of a show off. I'm not that much of a show off. I'm There's more, some great I'm more, photos I'm of you on, online though, you know, obviously well, when you're doing big shows and stuff. I may be a bit of a show off. <laughs> <laughs> it's proper rock star well, stuff. I think, um, I think all that stuff is, I, we don't even really think about it. I, I think it's, it's frankly ridiculous in a way to stand in front of 10,000 people with your top off and play music. I mean, it's a bit silly. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit crazy, the whole concept of standing in front of 10,000 people and playing your songs anyway. That's something that, if I thought about it too much, I wouldn't want to do it. I'd be too scared. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? It's like in front of all those people, kind of... It's, 
something that everyone dreams of. But there's, if you, there's obviously an adrenaline or a drug that kicks in that just because you obviously transform. You're not. It's 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 a facet of your personality. Right. You're not pretending. You're not you're not being somebody else. It just brings out another mm. part of your personality. I always say when you're down the pub with the lads on a Friday night, you speak in a certain voice. Yeah. When you're with your mother-in-law on a Tuesday afternoon. You're not, you're not lying to both of these people. You're just being a different version yeah. of yourself. And I, I think that's what it is when you get in front of all those people. It's bloody nerve-wracking, mm -hmm. so it brings out something within you. And you either kind of sink or swim, or you, you shrink, <laughs> or you, you show off a little bit. <laughs> where, where, what makes you happiest? Where, where are you at your happiest? Within a band context, is, is, it, is it on a writing journey? Is it 50,000 people at a big festival? Where, you know? it's, it's all of those things, really. Okay. It's all of those things. I think to some of my favourite shows, and it was in rooms not much bigger than this with ten people. Yeah. And you met them all after the show, and you all became friends. And and then if you headline Reading Festival, which is something we dreamed of since we were thirteen, yeah. that's a hell of a moment. But we've just re recently been doing some recording, some demos for the next album, mm -hmm. and to get to the end of of that process, which is somewhat still ongoing, but to to kind of finish the mix on those songs. That's a moment. Yeah. That feels incredible. You, are you good at? Do you know when something's a song done? And, and, and you, well, not just done, but you just go, that's going to be a big one. Um, I think so. I think mm. you, 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 not a big one. No, I don't know if that's the language. Just that's a good one. Right. I don't think you can predict what's going to be big. Yeah. But you can, you just learn to, to trust yourself and do I like this? Yeah. And you look around the room and you've all got the same expression on your face, yeah. the giddy. Um, when you solve a problem, a lot of our music is, there's a bit <laughs> of mathematics involved. There's a little bit of counting. And when we solve that problem, how do we get from this part to that part? Because at the moment, it's, mm. we're falling down the stairs. <laughs> you know, it's not working. And, and when you solve those problems, that's, mm. that's a really exciting moment where, because you, the journey of, of developing a song is so up and down. Mm. You, it tends to be the first time you play it together in the room, there's a real excitement. Then the next time you start to encounter the problems. So you go from this is the best song in the world to this is absolutely rubbish, I hate it. Yeah. Why are we doing this? We're wasting our time. Then you, then you solve another problem and you're like, this is the best song in the world. And then all of those things that happen and form the other songs mm. as well. So it, it can be on a Monday you think you've got 20 amazing songs, on Tuesday you think three of them are good, and then by the end of the week hopefully you think they're all good. And it, it's just a sort of, that, that's how I find yeah. it mentally, it's, it's a, the fluctuation of your kind of um, confidence in the songs and how you think they're going to turn out really. Did, did any one of the three of you have any sort of formal music education? Yeah, because you, you talk about this, and I think it's a great, again, for people not well, for people who are familiar with the Biffy stuff, mm -hmm. you know that you're right. S songs can go from a, a certain style mm -hmm. and sound to a very different one. Yeah. And I loved what you said about sometimes the problem is how do you get from it's, this bit that we like to this bit that we like? Absolutely. How do you get there? So are you? And some guitar players would have a very theoretical approach to how that some, would work. Some people could sit and talk about yeah. it. They, they could look at a chart of music, yeah. they could talk about that section, they could talk about that section, and they would know melodically how to get yes. there, what chords to use. I'm, I'm not so sure. So Simon studied violin as yeah. a kid and got to grade seven or whatever. He was really great. Ben, they, they did music in high school. I don't know if Ben ever had drumming lessons. I don't think he've ever had a drumming lesson. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple, mm -hmm. I don't know, something like that. So there's some education there, but not not compared to the other people we've worked with mm. since when you, you, they just sort of know everything about yeah. music. They know that if you do that, then the rule is you should do this. We didn't really know all of the rules. And I think that's why our music comes out mm. a bit weird, a <laughs> bit strange, a bit. We're also, we're always looking for the strange. Yeah. We're all, that's, that's where our kind of heart lies yeah. naturally is, in the slightly weird... So it's just trial and error to see trial how and you error, get from A to B. Trial and error, is, mm. you know, it takes a lot of time. It takes mm. a lot, and that's what I would say to people at home. you got to really want to do it. Yeah. you got to really want to be in a band to do it, because it, it can be tough at times. It can be a lot of work, a lot of problem solving. Yeah. But the joy you get when you solve these little problems, that's why we're still doing it. Yeah. You know, that's why we do it, because it, it, 
you're asking if is it recording or fifty thousand? Yeah, yeah it's, it's all of those things. Mm. But the, the satisfaction comes from in different moments from different yeah. places. I don't, I've not had, I've not had that personal experience. But mm. you, you know, you. I remember what I guess. Did you watch that Netflix Beatles thing? That, yes, I did. Yeah, and, you know, and that you th to capture on video the magic of just like something going oh here it comes yeah, it's, you know it, it, it doesn't usually happen like that for us <laughs> <laughs> occasionally it does but simon wrote one song accident without emergency he wrote it walking up the stairs he just happened to the guitar he went dum 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 and then he came up with a vocal melody by the time he got to the top landing he more or less had the song written and they're like you bugger <laughs> and then you hear it and you're like yeah that's mega that's mega and, and other times it's a song's burbling away for months and months and months and it's it's just yeah. kind of sitting there and then suddenly it becomes unlocked mm. somehow you have a, a new way of attacking things but on, on the on the recent songs we really tried to we mentioned off camera one of our rules is does the song work on acoustic guitar so you, we talk about pedals you talk about yep. sounds all that's really important part of it it's not more important than the song. Mm. So the song's got to kind of stand alone. Yeah, even if it's a big riff song, it's going mm. to sound silly in the acoustic guitar. But does the actual structure of the song work? Does it work as a song? Does it still kind of hit you in the yeah. heart? Because that, that's what music's got to be. It's not about wide stance and big poses and, you know, that's part of it. But it, it's about the song at the end I, of the I was surprised when you said that. Not surprise might be the wrong yeah. word but sometimes I, I i struggle to see how you even translate the finished biffy song which is big and fat, you know like wow uh -huh. to sort of almost going how do you even know when you hear that on the acoustic guitar that how it's well, going to end well, up you, you know you've started hearing the first thing you've heard is the big is the finished that's not where it started no so it kind of did start mm. either on an un, unamplified electric or acoustic mm. guitar, Simon in his bedroom. So that's kind of the that's where the songs are born. So it's not that hard to imagine mm. to go back to that place, you know. And um, songs are important to us, melodies are important mm. to us, rocking out big riffs are really important to us. But I think the song is the most important mm. always. I think that's always what we hold on to as a band. I want to talk about gear, and it's yep. not a bad segue here because I'm a, I'm a big believer in the gear for me, to a musician, it has two functions. It's mm -hmm. a tool mm -hmm. to amplify your music, but it's also inspirational. Yep. Um, and to a certain degree, that's probably why I think musicians rarely stay with the same gear forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever yeah. because it's the new gear you, you're, always, you're always kind creates. of searching yeah. always searching for something new it's like a, a never ending search yeah. even when you get a great tone like you say within a few weeks a few tours an album or two you're you're kind of looking for mm. something new when you've got something that works perfectly well yeah. it's just a kind of never ending search we're not led by sounds you know it's not so much that very often you get a new pedal and you write a new song I mean it's maybe as we've mm. you know, we've written a hundred or more songs, so you're starting to look for inspiration from different places. But I'm surprised him you say because not surprised. I I. I let, 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 let me say one thing to qualify yeah. at the start. So we used to go and play in student unions all yeah. down the country, yeah. and at that point, Oasis were the the yeah. hot ticket. So yeah. everyone was yeah. there yeah. in their parka jacket, <laughs> and they had lots of effects. We we were very much against all that, and it felt that we spent our whole time playing with bands that. We're more concerned about the effects, the effects pedals on their, their at their feet than the song that they were playing. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think for years that we didn't want reverb in the vocal, we didn't want any effects and everything. Right. We wanted everything dry. We remember we went in with Chris Sheldon to do the first album, and he brought all these pedals, and we were like, "Leave them alone. We've got our metal zone. And that's going to do us." And we were we were quite against using any technology or any, what we saw as crazy, mm. fancy sounds. We, we were quite kind of meat and potatoes, mm -hmm. let's keep this simple. And that was a reaction to seeing people rely too much on effects mm -hmm. and their sounds, but their songs are no good. So that, that that's mm -hmm. really, for the first few years of being a band, that's all we encountered was 
Bear in mind, we had our hoods up and we were facing the back of the room. We were really quite awkward young men, but we weren't, we weren't, we didn't have shades on, we weren't like mm. trying to, and I felt like all these guys were, it was all a bit of showing off. It was all a wee bit shallow, I thought, you know. I'm, I'm sure I read or heard somewhere though, that one of the challenges for Biffy in maybe in the last 10 or 15 years has been to try and tour the and get the album sound you yeah know, because that that doesn't you know you can't just go well i'll just literally turn up with my jcm 800 and plug a telecaster you, you, into you, it you, you do know. want to get close mm. you do want to get close it's obviously a different thing live and sometimes you, you you're not at a gig going how does that how did that sound on the rec you know you're not making that connection right but hopefully most of the sound is in your playing okay you know is that are you talking you personally or yeah, the band for anyone for, but I mean, even with um, Simon's I, stuff. Yeah, I think if you give Simon, Simon's a strat man. Mm -hmm. You know, he plays the odd Gibson. But I think if you, if you give him any guitar, if you, you know, any of these guitars and plugged them into any of these amps, I think it would still sound like Simon. And the, Neil. And the three of you, you the three of you could have a super stripped back set of gear and still well, sound we've, like Biffy. We've, we've got to. Yeah. We've got to be able to do that. Yeah. Now I think bands rely so much on track. They mm. rely so much on this and they rely so much on that. What happens when all that breaks? You need to be able to play the show. Yeah. So we've got, occasionally Ben's on a click track. Yeah. Occasionally there's a little bit of stuff, a little bit of sauce on some tape. <laughs> but our, arguably one of our biggest songs is Many of Horror. Yeah. We can't play that to a click because of the nature of the song. It's too up and down. Simon mm -hmm. starts it on his own. Yeah. We don't have loads, we don't have track. So you, you can't rely on all these things. You have to be able to play your stuff as a band. It's a proper rock band, kids. It's a proper, it's like... we're a proper rock band. We, we do play things for real, you know. <laughs> and we also go out, and that, that's why we, you'll see us do a lot of acoustic stuff. We have to be able to play the songs, just three yeah. of us. Ben's on a box. Um, you know, it's, Brilliant. you're not relying on the sounds at that point. You know, oh, that's and cool. then it's all about the song. Well, let's talk about your gear then. Yep. Uh, and we should shout out to the guys at Ashdown today. Absolutely. Uh, because you've used their I've gear I've used Ashdown forever. since since day dot, really. Um, and and yeah, I've known the guys at Ashdown since they weren't even Ashdown. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're a great British brand. Um, 100%. Great British brand. Try saying that to early in the morning. I'm, I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so yeah, what um, I mean, we can start with uh, your. Let's start with your bases and what you've typically used, and then we'll talk about the amps you use and sure. any pedals that you might plug in. My first bass was a Fender, a Fender P that my, my father yep. bought me for Christmas when I was about thirteen or fourteen. An un it was enormous, was it? Compared to you, <laughs> I mean, I don't have big hands now, but they were smaller there. An enormous neck, yep. maple, buzzy farty horrible thing but probably quite a good school to learn on mm -hmm. quite you know it, 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 a lot of work to, and really hard to get a sound out of it that's the thing it's still that uh, that's the thing it's trying to get a really nice sound out of a bass guitar is something i still find a challenge right and perhaps something that just keeps me coming back you know but an unwieldy thing so mostly fenders then i got a jazz i got a japanese mm -hmm. jazz really mm -hmm. nice skinny thin neck. neck yeah i'm in heaven I put some EMG pickups in it, I think, mm -hmm. with two 9-volt batteries, so it was the loudest bass in the world. Took all the knobs off it. Thought it was really clever, because sound engineers would come in, and you turned up, and you'd be like, it's always turned up. There's no knobs on it. Um, and then, I'm, I'm not sure what amp I had at that point. Then I discovered the Ashdown EBM mm -hmm. 150, little mm -hmm. blue face thing. Yep. And I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for this. <laughs> I would just stand and look at that. I thought it was the most beautiful thing. I do, I do love, love the tone out of yeah. it straight away. We are all suckers for this. I know that the, the guy, you know, the, the guys at Ashdown have made a jolly nice living well, they, out of uh, selling headphones with these on the sides of them. I thought that was a like... great move. Like, what's better than one VU meter? It's obviously two, you know. Yeah. It, it, oh yeah, one for the in, one for the it's out, perfect. of course. It's yeah, Bravo. I mean, it's, it, I think anybody that's a bit of an audiophile loves VU meters. There's just they? something it's... about it that, that speaks to a bygone era, yes. you know, there's something about it. For sure. Lovely tone, really warm. Find it a really, yeah. really warm tone. Um, and I've, I've never really, you know, like we talked about, you go on journeys. Mm -hmm. So, used Ash down, went to work with Garth Richardson in Canada. Mm -hmm. G -G 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 Garth, who did all the Rage Against Machine <laughs> albums. 
He he got us using a lot load of Canadian amps, so Garnet and uh -huh. Trainer, Trainer amps. Know, yeah. Um the Garnet's a little both sort of modelled on kind of Marshalls, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But really buzzy, really distort, you know, really yeah. aggressive. And for a while I was using that live with we ended up with like off stage ISO cabs and things got a bit complicated actually, sound wise. Right. It felt like I've now got a simpler setup, and um, I think it's all the better for it. I think with those old valve heads, you, depends what voltage they get. Right. The voltage is different every night. Yeah. And suddenly you'd be, you'd be there some nights just going, I'm just not really getting this. And there's nothing, unless mm -hmm. you're getting the right voltage into the thing, you're never going to get it right. So we've kind of been all around the houses, and I've come back to a DI out of the Ashdown head, mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty much the main part of my sound. Now you, we talked a little bit about, um, you like a little bit of dirt on your I do. bass sound. I think it's important to have a really clean channel mm. going all the time, mm -hmm. but in conjunction with that, I have another channel that runs through a Sans amp or something similar right. that I can put my pedals through. Right. And it, it just gives it a little bit of, like when the guitar drops out and I'm playing on my own, I need a bit more face, mm. I need a bit more, a bit more to it, you know? Yeah. But then when I'm sitting just underneath the guitars, I want it to I want it to sit mm. underneath. I don't want to be I wonder if we could even demonstrate because I I'm a terrible one on the on the guitar for uh -huh. buying a new Revo pedal or a new overdrive pedal or whatever. And then I've got it's like, oh yeah, that sounds great with loads of that and loads of that. And whenever I hear it back, even sometimes not even within a band context, just even just in eyes, you just go, there's way too much of that. You, you so get, how, how, do you, how did you learn to find that the right balance of sort of clean versus dirty and wet versus dry and all that kind of stuff? Trial and error. Trial right. and error a lot of time. Somebody else's ears is always a good thing. Because you're on your own, you get caught mm. in the moment. You're mm. you, Like you see, the, the instinct is to turn everything up mm. all the way, mm. you know, just really go over the top. But um, if you're recording, there's still so much to come after the bass guitar. I've got to be thinking about that. Mm. But I think we should, just I, I, one of the questions I meant to ask before before sure. we moved on to gear, because you touched on it a couple of times. Are you the are you the predominant sort of engineer type producer type? You know, within the band. Yeah, yeah. So I, let's talk about that for five minutes. Well, just I, to, I went to went to college out of school mm -hmm. to do music technology, and. Um, it was just setting up the PA, how does a compressor work? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. And I found that really interesting. I remember the day when we just had to plug up a PA, mm -hmm. plug a CD into channel one and two and send it to that monitor, that monitor, send out if they subbed. Yeah. And I, I just found that really fascinating. It just, yeah. I quite like thinking about signal flow. Yeah. That was something that was quite, it quite appealed to me. Um, signal to noise ratio, that's sort of, we're talking about this little box here <laughs> that gets lit of hums earlier on. I find that sort of stuff quite interesting, just to, how do you get a good clean signal mm. on things? So yeah, I sort of take, I wouldn't like to say I'm in charge, but I take responsibility for recording the demos, which we've, we've just finished mm -hmm. a bunch of songs there, and I love that process. Mm -hmm. I love the kind of taking the things that we've learned from Garth Richardson mm -hmm. and Rich Costi and Adam Noble, or some of these great studios we've been in, and then we go back to our little farm room, which isn't much bigger than this, and yeah. it certainly has a lot less gear <laughs> and not quite as nice gear. But I like problem solving. Right. I like all that. I've always found that really intriguing. Um, the process of recording is something that I, I, I feel that I could do that every day. I love it. Absolutely oh, cool. love and it. So, so are you now self-producing the more recent stuff, or are you still... No, we're using a, another producer. We're still using another producer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've talked about the potential for self-producing, perhaps in the future. Mm -hmm. It's something that slightly scares us, but we're not. We wouldn't be too scared. Yeah. Um, I think it's something to do with where we come from. Uh, um, Scots are kind of I don't know what it is. Always preparing for the worst. <laughs> if, if that's maybe what it is. Maybe not all Scots. I love but great British stereotypes. Well, I, love I love it. it. It's like. Um, we're confident in our abilities, but we're always waiting for everything to go wrong. We're always waiting <laughs> to get dropped by the label, and we do still have those discussions. And were it to happen, we would record ourselves, we would drive the van, we yeah. would carry the gear, we would do whatever it takes. I don't think the boys would carry the gear. They've made that quite clear that if I, I would be carrying the gear, but um, no, whatever it takes. I think we're lifers. I think yeah. we're actually doing this for real. And I don't think we're doing it because it's cool. We're just be doing it because we love it. Um, 
I, I quite enjoy solving the problems that yeah. you encounter in the studio. And um, so the recording, the recording process is something that really, really enjoyed. Um, I think it's good to have a, another set of ears, though. Mm. Somebody out with the band to maybe yeah. act as mediator or yeah. uh, someone, an adult, <laughs> is how I like to put it. <laughs> Just an adult to, that's, that's made 100 records before, yes. knows what to look out for. You know, we do it once every two or three years, and it's always about halfway mm. through the process. You're, oh, yeah, that's right. I, mm. I remember how we do that now. I'd never uh, thought about that, actually. Yeah, just, just the fact that... Because sometimes you... you, you Sometimes you, you, you accept that, you know, the producers actually ends up with quite a big credit on the, you know, commercially, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then you sort of go, do they deserve it? You know, and then, but then you go, actually, you know, you're right. You're actually probably trying to produce a record once every two or three years. And yeah. they're doing it they're five doing days a week, they're, they're ten doing, days a week. They're doing 10 or 12 records yeah. a year. You and know. so I suppose, yeah, it, and 100%. And you know, as, as gear changes, as the process changes, yeah. New plugins come out, you, you know. I remember working with Rich Cost here, he got a new set of speakers, so he wanted to remix the whole album. And I remember going, Well, but the new set of speakers that, that's just how you hear it, that's mm. not going to change how the people at home hear it. You know, I don't really care that you've got mm. new speakers, you've already mixed it, sounds great. But Rich Cost, like everybody else that works in the industry, is always trying to make things mm. better, you know. So you're always searching for that, that new kind of thing. Is it do you have, um, you know, you get some of these questions of, you know, if, if you could be in any band of any era, you know, what would it be? But mm -hmm. is there is there a producer that you just think, oh man, love to work with him one day? Or? Um, there's lots. We talked yeah. we were talking in the car yesterday about Steve Albini. You know, I'd love to go to Chicago and work with Steve Albini. I don't think we should do that for our next record. Um, that's something we talked about years ago. That was always a bit of a dream. But right. we got to work with Garth Richardson. That was. Ben, ben famously, well not famously, but famously amongst us, did a college music project all about Garth Richardson <laughs> while he was studying <laughs> in Stowe College in Glasgow and fast forward <laughs> 10 years and we're in Canada making a record with him, so that was, that was kind of cool. That is you cool. Know, and you have those moments when you're, like I've forgotten how many times we've been to Abbey Road and it's not because it's... I'm blasé about it, but we've been there a few times and you don't remember them all and you kind of have those pinchy moments when you're like, shit, we're in bloody Abbey Road, mm -hmm. you know? We've, we've been lucky to have soaked up and gained knowledge from, from lots of different places, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, look, that is, that is in, it'd be interesting to see again where, where it does go and if you do decide to self-produce and ha whether or not it gives this, the album a very different flavour or, or yeah. sound but I mean we're, we're very involved in the production right working with all these guys it's not like um maybe a more old-fashioned thing where you know the, the band don't get up the band aren't allowed in the control room you know the Beatles weren't allowed to go upstairs it was right. like the men in the shirts and the ties <laughs> and they were kind of making the decisions and that's amazing if you've got you've got that sort of relationship where you trust each other but I don't think we're the kind of band that wouldn't go into the control. You know, we're not like, right, you, you're you in charge of this, just tell us when we're done. No way. Like, we're in charge of it. It's our, as Omar was saying, it's our name above the door, so. 100%. Yeah. Well, look, we, we, were, we were talking about gear. Yeah. I did, we, and we were talking about that sort of sense of um, trying not to sort of have, uh, overdo the, the, the effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I always think, you know, there'll be people watching this where they'll go, okay, what, what do you mean by that? Is there any... Sometimes I know, like, we, we talk about if, if you get a good distorted guitar sound and say the distortion on the amplifier is at number eight, mm -hmm. or whatever it might Actually, if you want to record it, turn it to number five. Yeah. Because it'll sound just as distorted on the thing, but it shouldn't sound fizzy. Do you have, a, like, a, a golden rule ratio for bass players that could be similarly sort of easily... Um, conveyed. No, I'm afraid not. I'm <laughs> afraid <it>. not. <laughs> it's, it's, it depends on the song. Mm -hmm. It depends on the part. It depends on the band. Mm -hmm. It depends on what else everyone else in the band is doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ingie, Ingie Malmsteen's like, what's this less is more shit? He's going, more is more. <laughs> more is more. And we're a bit like that. Like I say, we're probably more maximalists than okay. minimalists. But it's my new favourite word, maximalist. Maximalist, yeah. but you I like I like to do that. But you have to sometimes, <laughs> you have to just sometimes take, <laughs> you have to sometimes just take it back a little bit, and you, if you you can go over the top, you can make things. 
I don't know. When you're playing on your own, that's one thing. Yeah. But you've got to play with the other guys around you. Yeah. And if you're if you're up to ten all the time, there's nowhere to go. Yeah. It's just, I just turned into that was just pure spinal tap. But you're <laughs> you're at ten. There's nowhere yeah, to but, but, go. Yeah, but but go to eleven. I've got eleven. Yeah. I've got eleven. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. All right, well, look, um, so jazz bass was your thing. I'm now struggling to remember where we got to with you. Yeah, yeah we, got, we got to jazz bass, so, to and jazz, jazz bass, bass kind of stayed your number one. You did a, you did a signature thing, didn't yeah, you, with Squire right. and did, Fender we, for a bit. I, I think that was a really, you know, not to, I didn't, I didn't make it, so I, mm -hmm. I can talk it up without blowing one trumpet, <laughs> but I thought that was a great instrument, f great value for yep. money, lovely thing to play, looked yep. great, sounded great, yep. really nice kind of entry-level bass, and something that I feel that like actually we've got here as well. Yeah. You know, in, in a different form with, with Ashdown. Really beautiful, beautiful thing. I think um, there are so many high-end products out there, but not everyone can afford to spend three mm -hmm. grand on a bloody guitar. So I think it's important to have something that is allows beginners to get in, something mm -hmm. a bit more affordable, something that's nice to play, but gives you a tone that is in at least the same world yeah. as all these posh instruments. You, you mentioned an early bass being active. Mm -hmm. um, have you sort of gone away from that now and just typically just using a passive style? Um, actually, I've had long discussions with my bass tech about trying to have a rig where either everything's active or everything's passive. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm on a wireless pack, so I can do some attenuation. I don't like to boost with the pack, mm -hmm. but I can attenuate the louder basses because I, I want them all to hit the amplifier at the same level. Right. I want to have consistency across. I'm changing bass on every song, right. pretty much. Why? Because there's different tunings. We're in drop C. It's a right tuning thing. We're, in, is it? we're down half a step sometimes. Yeah. It's it's a tuning thing. Yeah. Occasionally, it's just purely a sound thing. I, I want a different bass for o a different always sound. Always a four string, or are you dabbling always in the dark Always a four string. Arts. I'm not. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've used a five string in the studio a couple of times for right. for low notes, but. No, I just look at it and I'm immediately confused. I'm like, I don't know what what's this yeah, extra string. I'm the same that? with the seven string. I was like, <laughs> I, like don't, I don't know what this is no. for. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I huge respect for those guys that that, that can mm. get their heads around that, but um, it's a wee bit, wee bit musical for me, you know. Yeah. But um, no, I've, I've tried lots of different stuff. I've got a Gibson Grabber, mm -hmm. Gibson Thunderbird. Um, the Grabber's got a really nice aggressive tone. Thunderbird's a little more kind of woolly, mm. but sometimes that's exactly what I'm going for. But that's, that, I'd never heard that before, but that, that's a real um, live issue for you, is it? That if you've got 10 different bases and they've all got a slightly different output, you're, you're really trying to come up with a way to hit the amp the same. Is that even possible? How would you do that? Well, you can, you can monitor the level from each base, the way it hits the mm -hmm. receiver pack for, mm -hmm. the, for the wireless system. And I don't want to, I don't want to boost the quiet ones, because mm. that might, that's going to bring a tone. Mm. I'd rather just attenuate the loud ones. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it's to it's to try and get this, the same the same amount of drive going in, so that mm -hmm. the amp gives me the same valve drive mm -hmm. essentially. Just to have some sort of consistency. Yeah. You now the songs are not all consistent. Mm. Sometimes I'm playing a Nick Cooper bass with my fingers and Simon's playing an acoustic guitar. Yeah. So I'm less bothered about that needle yeah. getting red, but I kind of want that to, I kind of want it to shift that needle, you know, just because it looks great. <laughs> but that, that that's, yeah, with maybe 10 bass guitars over, not maybe not 10, eight, eight different bass guitars yeah. at a show, I'm trying to keep that consistency is quite important. And right. um, I don't think I've ever seen a bass player go through eight guitars in a set. I know. <laughs> That's a bit embarrassing. It's full rock Let, star, let, let's it? say five, then <laughs> four, something like that. But, um. <laughs> I love it. I think, you know, it's, it's like guitar it, players get away with it all the time, so why not absolutely. bass players? It's, it, it's, it's not vanity, it's not showing off, it is, it's I tuning, it's tuning, you know, a little bit. <laughs> it's, it's mostly a tuning thing, trying to get that, trying get to get that. that low C for us, it would yeah. be, you know, and, um, and, and occasionally just a different tone out of a different guitar. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of pedals then? I've got a few pedals. We, we've got the hyperdrive. I'm looking off camera here to see if I've got that right. We've got the uh, Ashdown hyperdrive, mm -hmm. uh, the velvet compressor, which is really, really nice. That just evens things out. There's a nice bit of compression on the amp as mm -hmm. well, but that just even evens things out in the way in. I've got a couple of dark glass distortion pedals. 
B7, perhaps? Right, I was going to say, are you doing anything a bit more unusual, like pitch shifting or the B7? Sometimes like you use, uh, I'm going to look around and you've probably like got a the pog. Or a, a pog, pog that's yeah. exactly mm. what it, they'll give me a, an upper octave yeah. for who's yeah. got a match. It's a kind of, I don't have it on now, but yeah. you, you might know that riff. And that, the pog will give me an upper octave yeah. on that. Um, yeah. Um, do you think the guy, do, do, do you think, um, have you ever met the, the guys from Royal Blood? Yes. Do you think, yeah. uh, I wonder now whether or not they probably found some inspiration in listening to your sort of, sort of stuff. And, and obviously he's a great, uh, he's got a great proponent of, of using things like pogs. And, yeah. and, and I suppose we talk about you making a big sound for a three piece. Yeah. They sound like an army. Yeah. There's only two of them. Yeah. Is it a pog that, that Mike uses? I think it is. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it he, is. He, he, he does a great job. Mm. It really, one, one thing I find hard with, either a pog or a lower octave is getting it to track very yes. accurately. Yeah. And sometimes you get that, yes. you can hear the pedal going, I don't know which, whether it's a fundamental frequency or a harmonic, yeah. I don't know what I'm tracking here. Mm. He seems to do it really well. I don't know how. I think, he, I suspect he uses really thin strings. I don't I know, a light, know, a light I, gauge yeah. of string. Certainly Maybe. the way he gets about the neck, yes. it looks like it's quite a light gauge. Yeah. I sometimes end up with a 120 and it's like, with Ooh, these wee it's, fingers, it's heavy going. The thicker if strings. If you're dropped down to C, though, I suppose it, it you need gives that. me that tuning. Mm. It, 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 it keeps the tuning a bit more consistent. But um, other effects, sometimes reverb. Okay. Occasionally been using a little bit of reverb. Um, Go on, what reverb pedal do you use? I I'm, have no I'm addicted idea. to reverb. I have no idea. Maybe a TC Electronics. Okay. Is that possible? So you, yeah, hundred well, percent. Yeah, so yeah. You've gone in reasonably sensible. Yeah. You know, every man kind of reverb pedal. Yeah, though. absolutely. A reverb and bass is like. I mean, Adam Noble, who's produced a couple of records, he's like, reverb can get out of my life. He, he really is always going on at me, but it, it just depends on the song. Oh, just remind me that never work with Adam Noble. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fantastic, a fantastic no, producer. I'm, I just, I, honestly, pl trying to play guitar for the me thing, with no reverb yeah, it, is like, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it, it makes things bigger. It's, it puts it in a tone, like puts it in a place, absolutely. And, mm. um, I mean, to be fair, on the the ash train's running quite clean. The other dirty channel is the sand sap, and there's always a little bit of drive in that. Mm -hmm. So that's never perfectly clean. There's yeah. always just a little bit, which means the pedals don't have to hit that too hard mm. before it starts to be a little bit distorted as well. Yeah. So I use the Boss um, Octave pedal, yeah. ODB3, I think it's yeah. called, but I won't use it for the octave. I'll just use it for the drive. Oh, right. And it just gives a little bit of drive. Yeah. Sort of breaks up the top end a little bit. Mm. Um, That's that. I, th I think, again, we were talking about how much I have very limited experience of doing some bass videos myself, mm -hmm. but you get a bass distortion I did pedal. notice that. I mean, I, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I apologise. Uh, but, you know, and, I, and, and it, you realise that you know, you've got this like zero to ten distortion control on the pedal, and if you're yeah. a guitar player, you're going well. It's like five or eight yeah, or whatever yeah. it is. Like. On bass, you kind of realise that actually, once you're hearing it back, if you go past like one or two, you just get a mush. It it just, it just makes a fart noise. You, you lose the clarity. Like you, do you, don't, you don't. You don't. I like to do that. You don't hear what the the right hand's doing, and you need that. Yeah. That needs to happen for me. Something I learned with Garth Richardson is when we were in. Again, a really small room like this in Canada. He, he sat with his his right foot on the front of the kick drum, and he just looked at me, and he was looking at my right hand, and slowly he was kind of going. He's going, look, watch watch that happen, and you do that at the same time. Really simple, simple mm. stuff. Do you think it sometimes it some really things, works? Yeah, and I think us being twins, if I can lock, if I can't lock in my right. twin brother's right foot with my right hand, then. And I, I, that that simplicity, mm. I think, creates power. Mm. To be honest, if if you've just got the bass guitar and the kick drum more or less doing the same thing, it's really powerful. There you go. That's what that's all we wanted. One of those in the video. A little bit of a trick. I but just it's, not, think, it's not a trick, you know. But and he, and, but you'll you'll put your foot, will you, on the front of the bass drum yeah, just so that yeah, you're really yeah, locked just, into just, it. I'd, in the practice mm. room at the gig, mm. I'm sometimes just sitting looking at Ben. At a gig, if you're having to look, it's too late. Mm. It, you, it should be yes. in there by now. But yeah. when we're first learning, we're first working out some stuff. I'm just trying to, just trying to 
match up match up with yeah. that kick drum really to give us I think just being three of us as well it's important that we're we're all pulling at the same time you know yeah. well look man I, I think that is that's great and, and what a great way to kind of sort of feel like we can sort of sort of wrap up I know mm -hmm. we I know again I must say a big thank you to Ashdown um, they, uh, they've brought down a, a couple of other um, bits of new stuff this is, that... this is some of the new stuff which I, I haven't actually had a chance to plug in myself yet but it, it's it's got the consistent Ashdown tone and I've, I've had lots of different Ashdown amps there's a consistency across the board you know whether it's all valve or it's just valve and the input there's something about the tone of the Ashdown stuff that that's it, great I mean they, I, if it I, says Ashdown on it it's going to be good basically you know I think visually this looks I, I'm, I'm, I always think Ashdown have a real eye for a detail and this mm -hmm. kind of like cut in lovely, front panel and stuff looks really pro and a bit different to everything else. And I else. think having travelled around a few different music stores in the last few days, it, it seems like people mm. are wanting smaller stuff. You know, I've got the big... I mean, that's crazy compact, isn't it? The isn't it? There. I've got the, the BTA 400, the big tube amp, which yeah. just like takes two <laughs> men to lift it, you know. And that's fine when you've got a bunch of hairy guys that are going to carry it for you, but... I think if I was lifting it myself, I'd be more inclined. <laughs> I'd be more inclined to get something. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's absolutely it's perfect, bonkers, isn't it? Yeah. So many options. So many. The typical Ashdown is a very capable bit of kit. You know, yeah. there's always a few extra inputs yeah. and outputs that perhaps aren't required, but are, are certainly very welcome. You know. Well, I'm I'm sure our bass duo of Lee and Cece will be checking this out on the channel soon. But honestly, man, for now. It's been an absolute, well, nice yeah, really been absolute it. pleasure. And again, hopefully, you'll have more bass players on. <laughs> you know, no big deal, no big deal. But you know, well, you know, I mean, if you ever get a, you know, six months where you're not doing anything with Biffy, yeah, and maybe next time I can come down and bring I'm a few basses. A, absolutely, and host, come and, and do maybe some I could demos. host. I could host. You know, I'm just, you know, you're trying welcome. to get myself a gig. Hey here, man, but, yeah, look, it suits me. But thanks yeah, for absolutely. having me. Really nice, no, really honestly, nice to see you. It's been a pleasure. Man. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and we shall see you in another video soon. Au revoir.